And on that graph, what it is, is the curve is going straight up off the page in that last pencil width of time. Simply not possible to sustain that kind of change. And then you can superimpose on that same 150,000 year uh, chart, you can superimpose virtually everything from fish catches to deforestation or the amount of logging that we do, uh, the amount of carbon we produce in the, and release into the atmosphere, and they virtually, I mean, if it's possible to go any steeper than straight up, they're all packed into that pencil width of time. And that's the challenge, is it's all happening at once, but we have no basic baseline in our lives. We're really not aware of the incredible change in our impact on the planet. We are now the most numerous mammal on the earth, on earth. There's never been as many uh, of one species of mammal as there are of us today, 6.9 billion of us, and we are having a very, very heavy impact uh, on the planet. We have become so powerful with our numbers, our technology, and our consumptive demand, and a global economy, that we are actually altering the physical, chemical, and biological features of the planet on a geological scale. The Nobel Prize winner Paul Crutzen says, we divide up the various epochs, the ages of the planet in geological, in terms of geological change. So there's a Pleistocene and the Pliocene and the Eocene and the Miocene and the Holocene. Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize winner says, this should be considered the Anthropocene epoch. The time in which human beings have become so powerful, we are causing geological change. We, uh, how did we get to this point of becoming such a powerful force on Earth? We are, we're not heavily endowed with uh, size, speed, strength, uh, sensory abilities. You know, you think of all the creatures that can see so well and hear and smell. I mean, we didn't have a hell of a lot going for us. We are just a naked ape. But of course, we had one big advantage over the rest of creation, and that was the largest brain to brawn ratio uh, ever in, in uh, biological history. It was the human brain that more than compensated for our lack of physical and sensory ability. That brain endowed us with a massive memory, made us curious, and impressively inventive. And those qualities of memory, curiosity, and inventiveness more than compensated for our lack of other endowments. We invented the concept of a future. The future doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is now and what we can remember from the past. But because the human brain invented the idea of a future, we are the only creature that realized we can affect the future by what we do today. Based on what we've accumulated in terms of our knowledge and our experience and observations, we can now look ahead to the future and we can see how we could choose a path today to avoid dangers and exploit opportunities. I believe our great advantage over the rest of creation was foresight. Foresight that enabled us to, to dream of a world to come in which we could avoid dangers and exploit opportunities and then work in the present towards achieving that. It brought us to our point of dominance, and now we've occupied the entire planet, and we have scientists, we have supercomputers, who can act in the very best tradition of our species, pull together our knowledge that we've accumulated, and then look ahead to the future and see where it is leading us. And for over 40 years, scientists have been warning us we're going down a very dangerous path, began perhaps with Rachel Carson and Silent Spring in 1962, Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb, the Club of Rome reports. We've heard over and over again from scientists that we're headed down the wrong path. Scientists acting in the best tradition of our species, looking ahead and seeing where the dangers and opportunities lie. I want to just read something from this remarkable document. It was released in November of 1992. It's called World Scientists Warning to Humanity. When you look at the more than 1,500 scientists who have signed this, these are not third or second-rate scientists. These are the top scientists in the world. 
Over half of all Nobel Prize winners alive at that time, in 92, signed this document. So you got to say, we should take this fairly seriously. What were they warning us about? Human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current practices put at serious risk the future we wish for human society and may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision our present course will bring about. And then they go on and list the areas of collision. The atmosphere, water resources, oceans, soil, forests, living species, and population. And then the words grow even more bleak. No more than one or a few decades remain. This came out in 1992. No more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects for humanity immeasurably diminished. We, the undersigned senior members of the world scientific community, hereby warn all society, all humanity of what lies ahead. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. And then they list the five most urgent things that we must begin immediately. This is a frightening document. Scientists of this stature don't go around signing routinely documents uh, of this nature. So it's very, very unusual for such eminent people to sign such a strongly worded document. But if this is a frightening document, the response of the media around the world was terrifying. There was no response. I can't say in New Zealand, I'm sure your press are very different here, but in North America, none of the major television networks bothered to report it. In Canada, the CBC, our national broadcaster, didn't report it. Our only national newspaper at that time, the Globe and Mail, didn't bother to report it. So, uh, you know, you've got to wonder what we're being informed uh, about when, when such a, a, a statement is basically ignored. I sat on the Millennium, as a board member of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, a United Nations uh, uh, committee that was uh, the largest study ever done of the state of ecosystems around the planet. Two years ago, uh, we completed the work and it was a frightening, uh, a frightening document, as you might expect. The announcement was made in New York City. Kofi Annan was still the UN Secretary General. He was there to announce the results. In Canada, we uh, had a report in our national newspaper on page three of our national newspaper, reported the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment results, which was terrifying. The very next day after the press conference, the Pope got sick and went to hospital, and his illness, death, and succession pushed everything off the agenda. So what was the largest study, the most impressive study ever done of the state of the globe's ecosystems was a one-day page three wonder in Canada. And then we, we went on to other things. I arrived in Australia, uh, gee, four weeks ago now, uh, the day after it was announced that 20% of plant species on the planet are in danger of going extinct by the middle of this century. I arrived in Australia, and what were the banner headlines? Australian dollar reaches parity with the American dollar. Woohoo! So you can see what our priorities are. 20% of plant species in danger of extinction. We heard from Nagoya last week, 20% of vertebrate species could be uh, extinct by the middle of this century. And where do we put all of these things in comparison to the fluctuations in the economy or the Dow Jones average? It shows you what our priorities uh, are today.